Okay, thank you. I think we're gonna get started. Uh, we're gonna move on to upgrades and repairs. <laughs> Spills, overfills, corrosion. Oh my. <laughs> so, just as a bit of a background, CFR, like I mentioned before, parts 280 and 281 were established in 1988, and these were the technical regulations with, um, with regards to underground storage tanks. So they were designed with the sole purpose of improving the ability of a UST to prevent a release. So they decided for UST systems installed after December 1988, the following requirement, requirements um, would be needed. The idea was to protect their systems from spills, overfills, and corrosion. Okay, and what I mean by spills is when the tanker truck is making a delivery, you wanna make sure everything gets into the tank and that's it, and then overfills, um, also have to do a tank delivery is making sure you're not overfilling the actual tank structure. And then of course corrosion, you wanna maintain the integrity of your system. And we'll go into lots more detail about each of these. Okay, so the question was, what about the systems that were installed prior to 1988? Okay, because these were the systems installed prior to um, Title 40. They had a few options. They could retrofit with secondary containment, or they could upgrade the tank. And the intention of upgrading the tank is to bring it up to the current regulatory standards, or the other option was to remove the tank altogether. And if you did choose to replace that tank, it would need to be uh, double walled, which was the current standard at that time. Okay, some of you might recognize this if you've been around for a while. Uh, this was part of a brochure given by a state water board. Um, but my intention of showing this is to tell you that they had 10 years to make these upgrades. So if it, they decide to retrofit with secondary containment or if they were gonna make the upgrades or even removal, they had 10 years to do it from December 1988 to December 1998. A lot of you might have heard the term December, or I'm sorry, 1998 upgrades. This is what they're referring to. It's kind of become a common nickname for that, that time frame and those upgrades. Okay, so what types of systems are we looking at? What, who needed these improvements to help prevent um, releases and release detection? Yep, single wall, and the main thing being the steel. Steel tank and piping. Um, but of course, if you don't have any spill or overfill protection. And then one other thing was adding a striker plate. I'll go into a little bit more detail on that in just a minute. And then single wall tanks contain a hazardous substance other than motor vehicle fuel. They did not have an option. They had to take them out permanently, and if they wanted it to be used again, they need to replace it with a double wall. So it's still possible to see single wall gasoline tanks but you should never see any sort of um, single wall tank that's holding anything other than motor vehicle fuel. So for example, that your waste oil tanks, those, you should never see a waste oil tank with uh, corrosion protection. It, it should be double walled. Okay, and then whenever a site did get into compliance, regardless of whether it was doing uh, retrofit or upgrades, they got this, um, Compliance certificate, and you might still see these in uh, kind of the windows of the kiosk at the gas stations. They're not required to post them anymore. They, that requirement went away after five years, but um, most people did keep them around. So if you ever notice these, next time you go to the gas station, look for one of these, and you'll know that this certificate was given back in 98 because they met the upgrade requirements. Okay, I mentioned striker plates was one of the requirements, and I, for the life of me, I could not find a really good picture of a striker plate. So the point is, it's a, it's a reinforced part of the tank, and it's most often gonna be below um, the fill port. And the reason for that is that section of a tank often gets um, 
The manual tank gauge is used there, whether it's by the owner or the driver. That's where they're gonna test the level of the fuel, and it's not uncommon to see that gauge being thrown down, hits the bottom of the tank, and to bounce back up. So the, the idea of the striker play is to have something more reinforced to avoid leaks um, from that way. Okay, cathodic protection. I'm gonna go into this um, quite a bit of detail. Cathodic protection, uh, the intention is gonna prevent corrosion of a steel tank. Okay, so what's corrosion? Corrosion is gonna be the metal releasing energy trying to reform back to its natural ore. And here's just a little diagram showing that. Uh, for example, you have the iron oxide. It goes through the refining and milling process and it turns into steel, whether it be a steel beam, a steel tank, or what have you. And then you see the depiction here, steel is basically losing its electrons and it's corroding with the intention of trying to get back to its iron oxide. You know, because after refining and milling, it's not in its natural state. So that's what it's attempting to do. And here's just a depiction of a corroded steel tank, kind of what you might imagine. Okay, so like I said, secondary containment was an option, retrofit with secondary containment. Um, if you're not going to retrofit with secondary containment, your options are cathodic protection in conjunction with interior lining, or you have cathodic protection in conjunction with a bladder system. Okay, so we're gonna talk about interior lining and bladder systems in just a minute, but for now I'm gonna run through the cathodic protection methods. Uh, the first is a fiberglass clad steel tank, and that's obviously gonna have to be on a new install, because the fiberglass is actually attached to the steel. And we have an example down here, there's a small piece. I'm gonna leave all, we're gonna have some uh, displays up here throughout the presentation, and we're just gonna leave them up here as opposed to passing them around, so come on up at any time or on a break. And it's an example of a, a steel piece um, clad in fiberglass if you wanna see an actual um, small version. And then your other option is going to be a sacrificial anode or impressed current. Okay, don't forget these have to be in conjunction with either an interior lining or bladder system. Because if you have a fiberglass clad steel tank, that's gonna be the actual corrosion protection for the steel. So it's gonna keep that contact of the earthen material off the steel portion of the tank. Okay, here's just a, an example. Um, this would have been a, a new tank install because a fiberglass is actually bonded with the metal. And you can see the coloring, the fiberglass coloring. Um, and you notice all parts of the steel are covered. The bung holes, any metal part is really covered, so that's what's um, protecting the steel. So a sacrificial anode, uh, like I said, that was one method of cathodic protection, and it's a, it's basically sacrificing itself. It's a metal that's gonna give up their electrons more readily than steel. So in turn, the steel's not gonna lose its electrons and it's not gonna corrode. So some examples, if you look at the picture on the, on the right, my right, um, you see what you know essentially is a sacrificial anode and it's gonna contain something like zinc or magnesium. Because if you look at the image on the left, it's showing that the energy potential of zinc and magnesium is higher than that of steel. So they're more readily gonna lose their electrons over steel. Okay, so I'll go into some more detail on that. Okay, and here's just a little bit of a plan view. This is from the EPA website, and it shows a typical installation. And you see that the sacrificial anodes surround the tank, and they're losing their electrons in place of the steel. So that way they're maintaining the integrity of that steel tank. And as you see, they surround the tanks. And I imagine the system um, setup is determined by you know, the, the manufacturer. I'm not entirely sure how they decide what they need, but I am sure that there's some guidelines that must be followed. Okay, the other option, considered cathodic protection, that would be in conjunction with um, a bladder system or interior line tanks, is an impressed current system. And the idea is an electrical current is sent from the rectifier, which is that box on the left, to anodes in the soil surrounding the tanks. In which case, uh, you know, the electrons are distributed toward the tank, thus protecting the tank. So as the steel is losing, um, this electrical current is 
pretty much sending them back in. So that's protecting it from corrosion as well. And just another plan view of, of an impressed current system. You see on the left, top left, you have the rectifier. And that's accessible. That's going to be accessible to the owner, the inspector. Um, and then, of course, you have your test meter associated with it. And you have, once again, um, the anodes surrounding the tanks. But you also have the electrical current surrounding the tank farm. OK, just uh, regarding testing, cathodic protection systems are tested within six months of installation and every three years by a cathodic protection tester. And that is actually defined in Chapter 6.7. It'll tell you exactly what a cathodic protection tester is. And then additionally, if you do have an impressed current, um, the rectifiers themselves are required to be inspected every 60 days. And that's going to be by the owner operator. Okay, and what they're doing is they're looking that to main, making sure that they're maintaining the voltage that they need. And it's fairly obvious if you see a rectifier in person where basically where that little uh, needle needs to be. And they also need to um, log their results of their inspections. And that's something else that we'll look at while we're there and we'll also look at the logs. Okay, so like I mentioned before, in addition to cathodic protection, you're also doing interior tank lining as an option or the bladder system. So for tank lining, um, what, I jumped ahead. Okay, so within 10 years of lining and every five years thereafter, they're also getting an inspection. Do you all do these inspections under, under permit? Do you have any experience with these types of inspections? Here's just a sample of the interior of a steel tank being lined. I've seen about seven of these, so it's not very common. Okay, and then the other thing to keep in mind is a line tank does not equal secondary containment. So don't feel that because you have a line tank, you meet the secondary containment um, criteria. It's just simply used as corrosion protection. Yes. Do you require that they do the entire, that they line the entire tank, or only half, or only the So the question was, is it required to line the entire tank, or just uh, parts of it, such as a seam or the top? It's my understanding that's the entire tank. Otherwise, it would leave portions uh, more susceptible to corrosion. Thank you. Okay, like I mentioned, the other option with cathodic protection is a bladder system, and that's going to be a flexible or rigid material, which is going to provide primary containment, and that's going to be added to uh, the interior part of the existing single wall tank. And most of them are designed to be um, contain the interst an interstitial monitoring system with it. And um, can I ask if anyone has experience with a bladder tank install? I personally have not come across this yet, so. Okay. Pop quiz. Let's see what you guys remember from corrosion protection. True or false, an interior line tank is considered to be secondarily contained. False. That's right. It's corrosion protection only. Okay, so an upgraded steel tank needs interior lining or a bladder tank in conjunction with Katha. Cathodic protection, yes. Okay, spill containment. I'm going to pass this on to Zoraida Herrera, and she's going to talk to you a little bit about spill containment, and also go into more details on the upgrades, which is going to be the spill overfills, um, and I just addressed the corrosion portion, so. Um, I'll be talking about spill containment, uh, the first part of my um, topic. So regulations required that USTs have to be protected against overfills and also for during spill for spill prevention. Um, and who has to protect this? Who has to provide the, the protection for spill containment and overfill? It, ha it relies on the UST owner and the UST operator also, or if e either or. Um, so spill containment, what, what is it? This is a draw, uh, photo showing two spill containments, or also called spill buckets. Um, and the one that we see with the black cap 
that's the actual, that's the field tube. Um, that's when there's any delivery into the tank. That's the, that's the drop tube where the delivery person actually hooks up the hose and delivers fuel into it. The other spill bucket with the orange cup, that's the vapor. Uh, that's the vapor riser, so to suck up all the vapors that that are going to be released during the delivery. Um, what, a spill bucket is required there. Uh, yes, it is required, and the reason is that sp spills or vapors can also exit from that uh, port from the vapor riser, and they can also condense condense and create liquid, so we need something to capture that li liquid. That will be on the vapor, the vapor bucket. Now, do we, do both have to be tested? No, per regulation only the filled bucket, the one with the black lid, has to be tested, but the vapor bucket is also recommended to be tested. That's recommended. The, the one for the fuel delivery, that one has to be tested. Mm. Uh, spill buckets or spill containments have to comply with certain criteria. They have to hold at least five gallons of, in this case would be a spill, right? If there's any spill. And these spills usually, well, they have, they occur during deliveries. Um, they shouldn't, but if the person who's delivering is not careful enough, um, you're gonna have a, a, a spill in that container. Now, the reason for this spill bucket is to capture that spill that occurred. It's not supposed to hold it for a long period of time, so if there's any liquid that, that gets a spill into the containment, into the spill containment, it has to be sucked out uh, quick, either with a drain bulb, either you have a drain bulb like you can see in the photo on the left. Um, that would be a way to, if, there, that, if that fuel got captured in the spill containment, that fuel can go again into the tank. Now on the other picture on the right side, uh, that would be a pump. So maybe you don't have a drain bulb and you cannot deliver that fuel again into the tank, but now you can pump out that fuel. The thing is that that spill containment has to be dry and clean. And of course they both have to be working. You want a, pump, a functioning pump and also a drain bulb that is working. And they have to be tested annually. Now regulations, uh, neither the Health and Safety Code or the California Code of Regulation specify how s spill containments have to be tested. They only say that they have to be tested annually. And they also say that since it's not specified how any person should be able to test the spill containments. Although most of the coupas, they, they don't like the, for example, the UST owner to test the spill bucket because if, it's, if it fails, maybe he is not gonna tell us. How are we gonna know that it's actually working? So what usually those spill containments get tested at the same time as the, second, as the UST monitoring system is being certified. And most of the time, it's the spill bucket test is also witnessed by Coupa inspectors. And how are those containments gonna be tested? As I said before, there's no, specifics on how to in the regulation or on the law, but um, the State Water Resources Control Board came up with three different methods. One would be the vacuum test. Um, that one is, the way it works, um, a, lead, a lead has to be sealing the bucket and then vacuum has to be pulled in the bucket. How much vacuum? Well, it depends on the manufacturer of that, the manufacturer of that spill containment. Um, and then if you see any, how are you gonna notice any leak? Well, you're gonna be pumping vacuum and you're gonna cover, you're gonna use soap. So if you see any bubbling also, or any bubbles, uh, you, will need, you will know where the leak is occurring. And the benefit of this test is that it doesn't generate any hazardous waste because you're not using any liquid to test it. And that is not very common, at least I, I haven't seen it. Have you ever seen any vacuum test on the spill containments? Anyone? I guess no one. Um, so it's, it sounds very good, but it might be not too practical because it, 
I, it seems like it's very hard to get a good seal in the spill bucket. Um, and also, the, well, the second method would be the hydrostatic test or the lake test. And I would say this is the most common one. This one requires um, the spill contaminant to be tested with water, and it has to hold the liquid for one hour. And that would be a visual test. So this test, you just take a measure of the level of the liquid in the spill containment at the very beginning of your inspection, that, or whenever you add the water, and then you have to go an hour later and read the level of the water in the spill containment again and see if there was any difference between the initial reading and the final reading. And of course, if the level of, if the, level of the uh, water went down, that would be a failing, uh, failure that will be a failed test. If it stays the same, then that's a passing test. Um, the third option would be a hydrostatic precision test. This one, is, it uses instrumentation. Um, the pretty, uh, as an example, the Incon, are you familiar with that? The Incon actually, it's, it relies on sensors and equipment. So also the spill containment gets filled up with water. Um, and then a sensor, it's put immersed in the water, and you have to see, you, there has to be some room, if, if you have the, let's say, let's say this is the sensor and you have the float here, it has to have enough space above and, up and also underneath, so you can freely move up and down, depending on the level of the water. Um, and you have to check actually that, because some contractors trying to trick you, they might put the float at the bottom, so if there's any drop on the level, you're not gonna be, that is not gonna read it, because there's no room for the flow to move down on, the, on that probe. Um, and for this, for the hydrostatic test, again, since there's no specifications, then that's gonna be depending on the manufacturer of the equipment that is being utilized to test the spill containment. And as in this example, the Incon, that requires for two consecutive tests of 15 minutes, and both tests have to be, have to provide passing results. Uh, and if you need more information or more specifics on how to test, uh, we can refer to the local guidance 166, uh, and that's from the State Water Resources Control Board. Uh, this is um, a form to, to, record the results of the spill containment test. Um, as with most of the tests, they have to provide us a 48-hour uh, at least notice a notification before doing the test. And then once they run the test, um, they have to provide us a copy with the results 30 days after the testing. And this is, spill, this is a spill bucket form, it's pretty easy. It requires the information of the facility, the information of the testing company, also information about the spill testing, how it, the spill containment test, how was it done? Was, did they use a hydrostatic test or what, did they use a vacuum test? Um, they also specify there if they use Incon or if, they, if it was only a visual test. And then, as you can see on the columns, you would have a, well, for one spill containment, let's say for the 87 spill bucket, and maybe they also list the vapor, which again, that's not required to be tested, is recommended. But sometimes they just put 87 fill, 87 vapor, and then 91, depending on what fill they have in their tanks, or waste in their tanks. Um, this form then reads, if they were using, well, they have to write there the, the readings on the initial test and al also the final reading. And then at the end, they mark if it's a passing result or if it was a fail. If there were any failures, they have to comment, to make some comments. Maybe they know, maybe they already noticed that what fail was, the failure was due to the drain ball, so they can make any recommendations there in the comment section. And of course, sign it and date it, signed by the technician who certified. So why do spill buckets have to be tested? Well, they have to be tested because if their purpose is to capture any leaks that occur during filling the tank, well, they have to hold that leak, right? It's, if that containment is not working properly, it's just there around the, the fill riser, but it's not doing anything. So it has to hold uh, for at least the moment 
for enough time for the driver, who is usually the one who's going to notice any spill in that containment, for the driver to clean that spill containment, spill containment app. Um, and if there's any failure, like in the picture we can see, um, that's during a test, that water is just going to end up in the secondary containment. And that's fine, right? The purpose of the secondary containment is to capture. But the purpose of this spill containment is also to hold that liquid. So that spill containment, that's a violation. They need to fix it. Um, and I just forgot. Well, that in that picture, we don't know if, if it's a, a, a fill or a vapor, but either or. I was going to say that if you're fill, if the technician is filling up that bucket and then they see, or you guys as regulators notice that there's a spill, do they still have to fill up that bucket all the way up? Yes? No? No, there's, that's an obvious failure, so there's no reason to contaminate more water and generate more hazardous waste. How often are spill buckets required to be tested? Annually. Can they test? Can they be tested more frequently? Yeah. Are vaporizer spill buckets required to be tested? Are they recommended? Who recommends that? <laughs> okay. Um, the the next topic is overfill. Now, the spill contaminant is there to capture any spills, but. How can we, can we prevent spills? Yeah, well, the overflow prevention is there precisely for that reason. And the overflow prevention, well, it, it improves the ability of the UST system to prevent any releases when fuel is being added into the tank. And those were required for new tanks uh, being installed after 1998. And also, all USTs that were already in place, they had to retrofit this overfill prevention system as part of their upgrades. Um, and here in the picture, which we can just see a fuel truck that is delivering uh, fuel. And as you can see, it has two hoses. One is the one that is going to deliver the fuel, and the other one is the one that is going to pump out the vapors from the tank. And as a good person here, a delivery person, he's standing right there. So if anything occurs, he's ready to take, I hope he's ready to take action. At least he looks like. So for overfill prevention, there's three, uh, no, there's four options. The first one uh, um, relies on having, uh, the operator has to be notified when the tank is full at 90% of its capacity. And how how is, is that getting the how how is the delivery person gonna get that message? Well, um, option one says that fuel delivery has to be restricted when the level of the fuel reaches the 90 percent, or by triggering also an alarm, audible and visual alarm. The restricting the flow that works with a ball float. Um, do you all know what a ball float is? And I have a, there's one on the table that we can show later to you. Um, uh, or says it's gonna lift it so you can see it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a regular ball float. And the way it works, that ball that she's actually holding, or it, you can pass it on if you want. You can pass it on here to me if you want. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, it is heavy. Okay, so this is the vent riser. Uh, can you all see it? This is the uh, bowl. So when the tank is being filled up with fuel, this, the vapors, of course, the, the volume of the liquid is rising. And the vapors on the top of the tank, they're getting compressed, right? So there's more pressure on the vapors. Now the vapors, want, they want more space. That's a, that it's a gas, or well, it's a, in, a in a gas form, but it's, it's a vapor. So they want more space. What they're gonna do is try to find an exit. This is a regular exit. This is the vent or the vapor riser. Um, so with the vapor, with the pressure of the vapors, th those are gonna push this ball up. And as this ball goes up, it's gonna block this section. Um, if there's good seal, 
There's no gonna be any exit for the vapors to go out from the tank. So that's because of pressure that's gonna restrict the fuel in getting into the tank. Now if there was a bad ceiling here, the vapor would, would escape easily from this vapor riser. Um, so that wouldn't be, that would be a, a not functional bulk float. Um, and so option one offers two methods, right? The bulk float or the audible visual alarm. Now option two also relies on the bulk float and also in the audible visual alarm, but this one says both have to be used, not just either or. This, this one requires both. Uh, but this one is not 90%. This one is 95% of the volume of the capacity of the tank be full with fuel. And it also has to start restricting at 30 minutes before it actually reaches the 95%. So this means uh, it should be, the fuel should be being delivered into the tank slower than at the, in the previous option, right? Because it has to give you 30 minutes to figure out that it's actually gonna, that it's reaching the 95%. And at all times, it also has to give enough time for the delivery person to realize that the tank is reaching its maximum capacity. Um, so at 95% and the audible alarm has to be triggered at, at least five minutes before the tank overfills. And that, that's the definition for a bulk float, or also float vent valve, and that's just this e equipment that I was showing. Uh, the audible and visual alarm, that would be the ATG, or the audible, no, automated tank gauge, I'm sorry. And now the automated, automated tank gauge, it has to be visible to the driver. The delivery person is the one who needs that equipment there. If it's hidden behind a canopy or somewhere, that's not a good location because the only purpose of that is to alert the fuel delivery person. So you can, you can, you as regulator can also ask the facility to move that overfill if it's in a location that is not easily visible. And that's a photo showing the ATG. Um, this is, that's the probe. That flow that where the arrow was dot. That's the fuel float here. That one is the, that's the one that's gonna measure the uh, the level of the fuel in the in the tank. So usually, when if usually that would be the one that technicians actually pull out a measuring tape and they they measure the probe and see if the tank may be relying on the tank charts, it would say the 95, the 90% 90 of that tank, it's gonna be reached at 76 inches, for example. So they measure that length of that probe and they put that float exactly at the 76 inches and that alarm has to go off because it's pretending that the tank is being full now at 90%. And usually, well, they have to go slowly rising that float because that's what the technicians say. I'm not, I'm not a certified technician. They say that if they go too fast, it, does, it doesn't read it as well. Um, the other float on the bottom, um, this one, that one is, uh, is to detect leak water in the tank. Um, that one, we don't, te we don't test that one, but uh, the UST owners and operators, uh, well, that, that's a good float to have because it, if there's any liquid, any water intrusion into the tank, that's gonna also give an alarm saying that there's water in the tank. Or also maybe they are getting, that hopefully they're not getting just, hopefully they're just getting fuel and not fuel mixed with water. But if they do happen to get water into the tank, that flow is gonna rise because water is gonna lay on the, on the bottom and fuel is gonna go up. So that flow is gonna detect any water intrusion into that tank. We don't test that one, but it's also there and that um, it's capable of doing that. Now in the in square, that's a photo of a, the audible alarm and also a visual. Um, and it also has a the button uh, the, that has a test button right on the right side. <laughs> um, so if, if when they test that float and it reaches the 90%, it's gonna buzz really loud. 
and the light also has to go off. So it will be blinking. And again, it has to be loud enough for the driver to hear and visible to the delivery person. And the test button I was saying is just in case you just want to see if they actually, if, if the light is working, you can just go there and press that button instead of testing the entire probe again or the ATG. Um, and that would be, in a, for example, when, let's say you're testing the overfill and it's working because you've got an alarm inside on the monitoring panel, you're getting an alarm for the overfill, um, but maybe the light doesn't work. Uh, that's very common. So the, usually the technician, the, he would come and open that red canister and replace the light bulb, then test that again. So you can just go and press the button and see, oh yeah, it, it, it is working now. That's an easy fix, and that's very common that data is actually um, failing. Now on the picture on the right, that's, that shows how the ATG is actually connected to the UST monitoring panel. Uh, so that means that's electrical. And any alarm that gets triggered by that float, it's gonna be registered also in the UST monitoring panel. And that's a picture of the same ball float. And uh, there you can see on the photo on the right side how, well the two photos on the right, the one in the middle, that one shows the ball the, at the bottom and as the vapors are rising that ball, it actually, uh, ends up blocking that exit of the vapors. So that's what causes a restriction of fuel getting into the tank. Uh, the third option for overfill prevention, uh, this one says that the system has to provide positive shutoff of the flow to the tank when the tank is filled at 95% of its capacity. And this is also, or more frequently referred to as the flapper valve. That fourth option is the same, it's also flapper bulb. But this one doesn't give a percentage. This one doesn't say that it has to shut down um, the flow of fuel into the tank at 95%. This one just says that none of the fittings located on the top of the tank have to be expo exposed to any product. You see the difference? I hope. <laughs> and that's a photo of a uh, flapper. Um, the photo on the left shows uh, that's the regular position of a flapper valve. Let me see if um, that would be the float. And as fuel is filling up the tank, it actually it rises this float here. When this float rises, it closes this flapper here. By closing that flapper, it doesn't allow any fuel to get into the tank again. So that's what it's called automatic shutoff. Any questions so far? Clear? So how many options are there? There are four. The first one relies on flapper valve or over or ATG. The second one is flapper valve and ATG. The third one is automatic shutoff at 95%. And the fourth one is the flapper bulb with no percentage, as long as the fuel doesn't get into contact with anything outside of that fuel, fuel riser. Got it? Um, that's how you would see a flapper in, a, in good conditions, and that's just looking inside the fuel riser. So that, that flapper is open, and that's how it should be. Now, that's how it doesn't have to be. In that case, they're also using a flapper, but as you can see, there's a, a dipstick here, which maybe and the delivery person was measuring with, a, with this dipstick what was the volume of the, of the fuel in the, in the tank, or well, reading the, the height of the level, the height of the fuel in the tank. Um, I don't know, he let it go there, and he didn't took it out. Now that dipstick is blocking the flapper. Is that flapper gonna work? If someone else comes later and starts filling up that tank, that flapper is not, it's, there's no good use for that. So that's an easy violation, they, and that's an easy fix too. Um, they just need to pull that stick out, and that flapper has to be able to move freely and actually chat down. They, they, the truck drivers do that on purpose. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I thought everybody said yeah. <laughs> um, he was saying that drivers actually do that in purpose to, to leave the dipstick there so they can actually add more fuel into the tank so their fuel truck it gets empty because they cannot return to their base. Okay. So they would just do it in purpose so they don't get in trouble at their office <laughs> because they need to get more fuel into their trucks. But they got this facility in trouble. Um, as I was saying before, this facility, um, th there's nobody there on site. Um, so who's gonna notice that? Only that you, the DO inspector, when he comes, um, and maybe he, com maybe he came yesterday, so that's not gonna happen until 29 more days. Or maybe it happened just during the inspection. Uh, yes? Um, if there was a flapper and also an ATG, that I and if they are filling up that tank, that ATG would also alert th the person who's delivering the fuel that th that tank is being filled up. Now that actually reminds, thank you, <laughs> you reminded me of something. Can, how many options can you use for a, an overfill prevention? Do you only have to use one? Can you rely only, only on the bulk load? Or can you have the bulk load and the ATG? and the flapper, you can have all of them. And that, that's better. Now if, there's, if they're using all of them, the f if, you're, if they have the ball float and also the flapper, that flapper has to be higher than the, than the ball float. Because remember that the ball float restricts at 90% and the flapper restricts at 95%. So in order to have the flapper working and the ball float also working, this one doesn't have to, the flapper doesn't have to work before the ball float because then there, there wouldn't be any purpose for the ball float as overfill prevention. Now, this is a general lay layout of a UST system showing one by one. That's the location uh, where the yellow piping is. That's the location for the ball float. This is the vent riser. Um, the vapor riser, and this is the vent. This is the ATG, and as I was saying before, this is the flow that measures the level of water in the tank, and this is a flow that reads the level of the fuel in the tank. And this would be the flapper. So the flapper is inside the fuel riser next to the ball float, if they happen to be in the same containment, in the same main way here. Uh, this is the IT, and you can find this also anyway. You can find it in a separate sump, or you can find it also within the spill, so the spill, con the fill, the fill sump. It doesn't matter, as long as they work. Any question? Any other? So okay, if the UST system, well, they they do go bad, and if there's any repairs that need to be made, but by this gentleman here, or anyone who the UST owner decides to hire, well, they have to first they have to find what's what's causing the system to fail, Wh what what what's the problem? So they have to investigate, and this is for all all the components of the UST system. When there's a failure, let's find out what's causing that failure. So the first, let's say for example that someone, um, maybe at your facility you are, well not you because we are most of us are regulators, but if a facility is undergoing some construction and they happen to find a line, maybe they found a product line that they didn't know there, that line was there. Um, they, they should actually test that line again for its integrity because maybe they broke it, um, maybe they damaged it and now it's leaking. So how are we gonna find out? Maybe we got an alarm, but we don't know where it's leaking now. So let's, let's run some tests to find if it's still, if its integrity got uh, um, broken, then let's find how we're gonna fix that component. If, like in my example, if it was a pipe, well, maybe we can find exactly where we can uh, find the location where it's leaking and we can fix just only that portion of the line that is broken. Or maybe we would have to replace an entire section. And that will be done only by doing an actual investigation with which would include testing. Then if, if it, this happens to be a huge, a big repair, maybe you need a permit with your local Cooper, that would be a plant check permit. 
and the reason for plant check permits would be to run the, um, the repairs and also to have an inspection afterwards to, to double check that the system now is working correctly and that also that there are no failures. And that would be part of, that would be part of the tank, uh, test for tightness. And that's not only for piping, okay? That goes for the tank, that goes for the spill containment. If there something fail, let's find out what's causing the failure, then let's um, fix it. And if that component has to be fixed through a permit, which again, you're gonna find out with your local Coupa, uh, then get a permit and then complete the testing until you have good results or passing results. Now, the next topic is under dispenser containment. And as you can see on the, the on the on the picture there on the board, uh, that's a dispenser. We cannot see the under dispenser containment there, but I'll show it later. Um, what is uh, under dispenser containment? Well, as it, its name actually says it, we also, we call it a UDC um, because we love acronyms. You know that. Um, under dispenser containment, so that goes underneath the dispenser and it's there to contain, right? To contain any spills or any releases. Um, and it monitors the single wall components and also dispenser piping. And is that drawing clear? Um, this is the dispenser, this is the ground here. And single components, I, this would be the shear bulb. So single components within the UDC under the dispenser would be any piping that, um, wait, yeah. Single, uh, the single wall components would be this section here. Usually you have a double wall piping. Most of the time you can also have single wall piping coming from the tank into the UDC. And then here it ends up being single wall. So that single wall is gonna get monitored um, in the UDC. And also any piping in here, for example, above the shear bulb, any piping above that, it's not regulated by USTs. That means not regulated by Title 23 um, or by the Health and Safety Code 6.5, 6 6.7, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but if there's any release there, it's gonna get captured in the UDC. Um, now, it gets captured there, but then how are you? Oh, not there yet. That's an actual photo of a dispenser, uh, of a UDC. In this uh, photo, I don't know if you can see, but there's liquid in here, because this was a new installation. You can see the piping here, still the pea gravel here. Uh, so that they're testing, and this would be similar to the spill containment. This would be a lake test or a visual hydrostatic test. So they just fill up with water, the UDC, and they have to observe it to if there's any leaks um, by either walking around or with soap and, you know, like the soap water test on all the fittings on the outside, or maybe there's leak water draining out here, well, like on the walls on the outside, or you, they can, you can also check for moisture on the, on the ground, and then you can figure out if there's any leak. Sorry. Um, and also a good technique is to actually use a spray paint and spray the top of the water against the wall of the UDC inside, so you can, that, that helps you to visually see if there's any drop on the level of the fuel. And I don't usually do that, the technicians do it. I don't carry a can of paint with me. Um, now UDCs were required in all new, new UST systems being installed I after January 1st, 2000. But all USTs that were already in the ground, all the UST systems that were already constructed and in place, they were required to upgrade or to retrofit a UDC by December 31st, 2003. That means that by now, all dispensers have to have under dispenser containment. Now, what, what, what requires a UD, part of the UDC, um, it is required to actually, if there's any release into the UDC, it has to activate also an audible and visual alarm, just like the overfills. 
or it has to stop the flow of the product at the dispenser. And let me, I'm gonna show you the different options that we have here. This is a, this is a very common sensor, uh, and this is the actual, this is an, uh, a sensor, the same one that is in the photo, but this one is actually open. Um, it has a float here. So you have all this case in here, but the float is only this section. And it only goes up this small bottom he section here. Can you see it? Um, this is a Beetlewood 208 sensor, and this one has to be at the bottom of the UDC. And if there's any release, uh, of the fuel into the UDC, that float is gonna come up, and as it goes up, it's gonna trigger an alarm in the UDC monitoring system, and that has to shut down the turbines, okay? So no, no fl flow of product should be able to come through the dispenser. Not only the sensor, any sensors can be used. Uh, there's other systems, uh, Boudreaux, Ronin, and we have some other sensors down there on the tables that you can take a look later during the break the next break. Um, a different option instead of the sensor, it's not always sensors, would be a mechanical float. Um, <laughs> oh, now it is a pen. I couldn't find a pen earlier. <laughs> this is the float. Um, and this is at the bottom of the UDC. It's connected uh, through this chain here. And this chain here connects to this arm here that it's actually, um, this arm here is connected to the shear valve. So if there is liquid, and I'm saying liquid but it, because it could be fuel or it can also be uh, rainwater. If it, there's any liquid in that UDC, that float is supposed to pop up and as this float pops up, this chain gets pulled down um, and this bracket actually blocks the shear valve. So that's gonna stop the flow of product at the dispenser. So this one is a mechanic, that this one doesn't shut down the turbines. It only stops the dispenser. But it's also valid. And I don't think they're pretty awesome. They usually and very frequently, f not usually, but very frequently fail. Um, and the reason for that is that dust gets collected here. Um, and it just, the flow is, uh, it's, it gets harder for the flow to pop up. It does, it cannot move very easily. But, um, but they, they do work and it's mechanic. Um, so, I don't know, some people like those. Or maybe they don't have wiring connected to that dispenser and it, they just find easier to have the floats. Uh, the other option is to have a standalone sensor. And I'm, now I'm going to my right. Um, and as you can see on the photo, uh, this one, it, you can see here on the screen, it's actually, it's, you can see it's on. I don't, I don't, oh, can you see it? <laughs> and that would be the screen where you process all your, you know, your PIN number and you select your zip code and what grade do you want? Do you want a car wash? So that's one, that's a, that's a functioning u dispenser. Now that would be a sensor that is at the bottom of the dispenser, not at this moment because it's during test. This sensor is being submerged in water. Here we have it in the water. Um, and then this is gonna cause the, the dispenser to shut down. So this one, does, it's also automatic, but it doesn't shut down the turbines. The turbines are still running. It shuts down the dispenser. So again, there's no way for the fuel to be delivered uh, from the fuel, from the tanks through the dispenser to our vehicles or or whatever containers we're using for the for the fuel, so the three of them are valid and the three of them can be chosen by the UST owners or operators. Any question? That that was easy, right? The dispenser. So let's see if you remember everything I've been telling you. What types of overflow prevention devices are available? <laughs> Correct. Ball float, flapper valve, and ATGs. <coughs> By what date were all facilities requir required to have under dispenser containment? 
2003. 2000 was for new installations. 2003 is for all facilities. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the tank monitoring requirements. This is where I think things get interesting, but it also gets a little bit complicated. So please stop me along the way if you have questions. Okay, first we're gonna talk about single wall tanks. And keep in mind, we're talking right now exclusively about tanks. We're gonna get to piping in another section. So just keep that in mind. We're talking exclusively the actual UST. Okay, so you guys remember what an existing tank is, right? Is that a pre-84? Yes, pre-84, also termed as existing, and the date was January 1st, 1984. So the thing to keep in mind, these are most likely gonna be single wall tanks. You might have people installing double wall tanks pre-84, but they weren't required to. Okay, so here's just a little depiction of a pre-84 single wall tank. And this is kind of why the regulations came into place for double wall components. There's multiple locations, lo multiple leak uh, potential points, whether it's filling at the dispenser, you have your joints along the pipeline, or just plain corrosion with a lot of these steel tanks. Okay, so there's about six single wall tank monitoring methods. I'm gonna talk um, in a bit more detail about the top three, which is the SIR, ATG, and the continuous um, ATG. Manual tank gauging, groundwater monitoring, and VEDOS testing, um, that's very uncommon, so I'm gonna just kinda keep our attention on the more common methods that, that are out there. Okay, so first, we're gonna talk about SIR, also considered statistical inventory reconciliation. Okay, and when you're doing this type of um, tank monitoring, you're trying to detect a 0.2 gallon per hour leak, and you're also doing a biennial uh, tank integrity test, so that's once every two years. Okay, so what are we analyzing? Inventory. Each operating day, the product level is measured. And it's most likely being measured with um, the dipstick, that, that wooden stick that we don't wanna leave in the flapper valve. <laughs> um, so keep in mind with SIR, we're gathering data monthly. So when I say each operating day, uh, you're, you're pulling this information in a month to month basis. Okay, you're also uh, accounting for delivery. How much has been delivered, um, when, so you wanna keep track of all that. And then finally, you're also looking at dispensing. How much is leaving your system? Okay, so like I said, all this information is being compiled over a month's time. And what happens is this information is sent to an SIR vendor that's being contracted by the, the owner operator. And what they do is they send this information, which is uploaded or however it's added to this special software. And once they run the software, it shouldn't have a determination on whether it was, um, the tank is leaking or not. So, um, seems complicated, <laughs> but that's one option for the single wall tank systems. Okay, another option, auto ATG, automatic tank gauging, however you want to call it. Uh, basically, it is relying on that um, automatic tank gauge probe. And the idea is you need to run a monthly 0.2 gallon per hour uh, test. You have to do it when the station is closed. And this is also something you need to do monthly. So this is a standalone test. I mean, you need to pick a time of the month where you are going to run this test. You have to make sure your, um, the environment is right for this. You have to have a certain amount of fuel in the tank. You have to have waited a certain amount of time post delivery. And you have to shut down the station when, when you run this test. So it can be a little bit um, of an inconvenience. But another option is our next option, which is, oh, I'm sorry, let me get to this first. Um, the main items ATG monitoring is looking at is they're taking in mostly um, information on inventory levels and temperature. And here's a, just a visual of an automatic tank gauge port. This one happens to be direct bury, but I'm sure this um, 
This is rather familiar to most of you. Um, oftentimes, in some of the later tanks, you're going to find this in a sum, but it's not unusual that this is in a backfill, being a uh, pre-84 tank. Okay, so here's just another visual, just to give you an idea once again. We are using the ATG, and you know, we're just trying to make everything clear for those of you that this information is new. So this is that ATG picture that is right ahead. It's just showing you where in the tank you're going to find this piece of equipment. <laughs> okay, like I said, a better, well not better, I take that back, but it uh, seems to be a more convenient option is a continuous in-tank leak detection, which also uses the ATG. And the difference is, it's also collecting information on inventory levels and temperature, but it's, it's taking that information continuously throughout the entire month. So the station can remain operational, there's no shutdown, and it just gathers information throughout the course of the month on its own, and it'll give you an indication if it's leaking or not. So with both methods, both ATG methods, you're gonna have printouts from your monitoring system panel. Okay, like I said, we're, we're not going to go into too much detail um, about these four options, but if you want to talk to us about these after the fact or we can show you where to find them in um, law and regulation, we can certainly do that. So we just didn't want to take that much time and get to stuff that's more common. Okay, so pop quiz. Single wall tank installed on or before January 1st, 1984 is considered what? That's right. And what are some examples of single wall tank monitoring methods? A little bit louder. Thank you. <laughs> SIR is one, and then of course we discuss ATG, and then continuous um, in tank leak detection, and of course manual tank, um, groundwater, and vapor testing. Okay, so once again, we're still talking about tanks here, so now we're gonna move on to double wall systems. And here's just a, a visual, and don't forget double wall, these are considered new tanks, and they were installed after January 1st, 1984. So it's everything from then on. And you can see here, here's just a depiction um, showing the interstice. This is an example of a fiberglass tank and showing how it's got the primary tank and then the secondary um, jacket. Okay, so here's another depiction of what a post-1984 double wall tank looks like. And don't forget, we're not necessarily looking at uh, double wall piping at this point. But showing you how it works. You have your alarm panel at the top. You have your, your space for your sensor, so it has access to the annular space. And then you have your sensor at the bottom, and we'll talk more about um, sensor placement in these types of tanks in just a minute. But the point is, if you have a primary tank leak, you're gonna find that problem with the, uh, the sensor in the annular space. Okay, and you see the secondary tanks around. Any questions so far? No? Okay, we have six methods as an option for single wall tanks, but with double wall tanks, you really only have one option, which is continuous interstitial monitoring. So you're basically monitoring that space between the primary tank and the secondary tank. Okay, and we mentioned before um, several conversations that you're using a leak detection monitor to track this information. The sensors are hooked up to these, um, and you're never gonna have, in such a way with the UDCs that you have an option to have a mechanical sensor, you're not gonna have that option with, um, when you're monitoring this interstitial space, okay? It's always gonna be some sort of electronic sensor that's gonna be hooked into one of these, uh, consoles. So just some, some common ones out there. You've got your Incon on the top right, Vitaru, TLS, and of course uh, the Boudreaux system. So just a few examples out there. Okay, I mentioned before we have a couple different options for sensor placement. And you're going to find that they're going to be different depending on whether you have a steel tank or a fiberglass tank. So we're going to talk about steel tank first. And what you'll notice is on a steel tank you're going to have um, access to the annular space on the side of the tank. You're gonna have a straight drop tube all the way to the bottom. So you can see here, um, you've got this riser and you've got your sensor 
and it just sits right on the bottom of the tank. So this is actually, it's very accessible. It's, it's easy to determine if it's in the right spot. There's a couple different ways. You can hear it, you can actually hear it when you put it on the bottom of the tank, if you listen closely, because it's gonna hear, you're gonna hear the metal on metal of it bouncing on the bottom there. And then of course, um, the other option is when you take it out to look at it and do the functional testing, you're gonna be able to measure that cord and measure the length of the riser, which is another way you can determine if it's, um, if it's correctly placed. Because you always wanna have it at the bottom, always, always whether it's a tank, a sump, UDC. Uh, the idea is you're, you're trying to catch the leak at the earliest opportunity. That's really the bottom line with the monitoring. So of course, uh, you wanna remove the sensor, you wanna do the functional testing, and you often find um, a bell-type sensor in steel tanks. We don't have any examples uh, with us, but you wanna make sure that they're in good condition. It's not unheard of to have these bell sensors that are corroded. They've often opened up almost like a flower and sometimes they even get stuck in there if they're not in good shape because they don't fit through the opening anymore. So you're also checking for the, the cables. Make sure they're in good condition as well. Okay, and then fiberglass, you're gonna have a different type of monitoring. It's still interstitial, but you're dealing with what we like to call a wraparound sensor, okay? And I have an example right here, it's, it's wrapped up. The point is, this sensor and this casing is gonna be dropped down through the riser, and it's, the, the point is it's gonna wrap around the tank, and you're gonna have this float sensor sitting on the bottom, okay? It's like a, almost like a light switch here. So you know it's in the right spot when it's at the bottom and it's not an alarm. And if it's hooked up to positive shutdown, then your turbines will be running. Because when you start to bring this sensor up, um, your turbines tend to shut off or they, it goes into alarm as you're coming up the side because it's already um, flipped this float switch. So like I said, this goes through the inner uh, port and that's kind of shimmied around the tank so it gets to that low point. And even though you can tell it goes into alarm when you bring up the sensor around the tank, you still wanna bring that up and out, take a look, visually test it, and visually, uh, I'm sorry, uh, test the functionality of the sensor. So you wanna test it in the most normal conditions possible that it would encounter a leak. And then of course, you wanna check all your cables cracking. Um, sometimes they get mixed up. And like I said, this is fiberglass tanks that you're gonna find um, this type of monitoring. So here's an example of something that you don't wanna see. You see the jumbled cables, you see some fish tape, and so those of you that know, fish tape is kind of like a, a, a small rigid steel wire that helps um, people move the, the sensor around the tank. So what happens is, I mean, you can get a mess here and you don't know what's what. But this is what you wanna see. You wanna be able to move this sensor with ease, you wanna be able to take it out, be able to look at it and do your functional testing. So when it's looking this good, you're in pretty good shape. Okay, the other difference between double wall fiberglass tanks and double wall steel tanks is that you have a hydrostatic monitoring option with uh, the fiberglass tanks. Can anyone tell me why this is not an option for steel tanks? Good, corrosion. So here's just an example of how that hydrostatic testing works in terms of detecting some sort of release or leak. So the top picture, it's showing normal conditions. And normal conditions meaning you have um, access to your sensor. You have, and keep in mind every, um, let me go back to the previous slide, but every uh, hydrostatically monitored tank is gonna have this reservoir. And this is where the sensor is gonna sit. And this reservoir, not only does it act as access for that sensor, but it also gives it a little bit of stability because there, there are times where that hydrostatic level can rise and fall um, with temperature, with deliveries, with dispensing, what have you. So it gives that little bit of uh, stability within the reservoir there. Okay, so like I said, this is another cross-section showing um, the reservoir. 
and you see the secondary um, containment filled with either brine or polyethylene. It's never straight water, and I believe that's for um, evaporation reasons. Uh, but you notice uh, the sensor is right there where it should be. It's, there's going to be a range. It's going to de detect a drop or a rise in liquid. So. The bottom picture here shows what happens if you have an inner wall breach. So that means your primary tank has a leak. Don't forget, you have a primary and secondary. So you have the option of having your primary tank uh, leak or your secondary. But the point is, if you have a breach in the primary, that means that brine or that um, interstitial fluid is going to leak into the primary tank, OK? Because that's where the leak is. It's not on the outside. It's on the inside tank. So what happens is, is that level of water is going to drop because it's leaving the secondary and it's going into the primary. Okay, so you're going to notice a few problems. You're probably going to notice your, your water level in your tank, on your ATG is off, but most likely what you're first going to realize is that your sensor in your reservoir has detected a drop in uh, interstitial fluid, okay? So you see right here, and then um, in green, you have that interstitial fluid going into the primary tank. Okay, and then another option, like I said, you can have an outer wall breach because you're dealing with secondary um, contained tanks. So th the top picture shows a breach in the secondary under normal conditions, meaning um, you don't have abnormally high groundwater or anything like that, because that will uh, have an effect. So if you have a, a leak on your secondary tank and you don't have high groundwater, that liquid is going to leak out that secondary. Rather than going into the primary, it's going to go out into the environment. Okay? And once again, similar to the other example, you're going to have a drop in that reservoir, so it's going to go into alarm. Um, and then the other interesting factor is if you have a leak in that secondary tank, but you have the groundwater that's very high, it's going to exert a pressure on that interstice fluid, and it's going to actually force um, groundwater into that breach which in turn is going to raise um, that reservoir level up, which will also go into alarm. So it's going to catch something if it drops or if it increases, because it takes into account several different uh, situations. Any questions on that? I know it's a little much, but no? Crystal clear? Okay, here's just a real life picture of a reservoir. Um, you know, you're generally going to see these types of uh, pictures and have the opportunity to see these at uh, new tank installs, because this is really the only time that we're out there uh, prior to the backfill going in. Okay, and like I said, we're still talking strictly about double wall USTs. Uh, these are post January 1st, 1984 tanks. But also in July 2003, there are some additional options that were put on tanks installed on or after July 1st of 2003. And just a summary of those is that if they were installed on that date or after, they need to be product tight. And by product tight, I mean they had to be impervious to both liquid and to vapors. Okay, they were finding out that a lot of the, the breaches into the environment were not necessarily fluid fuel. I, you had a lot of vapor uh, contamination in your backfill. Okay, and then you also wanted to prevent water intrusion. Either high groundwater, surface runoff, precipitation, you need to keep those sumps dry. And then, of course, ELD became a requirement for new tank installs. And I think that's also when it came into being with the, we'll talk more details about ELD, so we'll hold off on that. And then also, the definition of pipe changed. It now included, where it previously did not, it now included, um, the word pipe included uh, fill pipes, vent lines, and vapor lines. Okay, so pre-2003, those were not considered pipe. So they were single wall up until that time. And we'll get into double wall, single wall piping um, after lunch. So, okay, how many attractions? VPH, how many of you are familiar with that term? 
Okay, good, quite a few of you. Um, the reason I say it's coming attractions is that although that's our next level of monitoring for a tank, I'm going to talk about VPH tank monitoring and VPH pipe monitoring at the same time. So we're gonna keep that topic for after our discussion on the, our pipe monitoring options. Okay, quiz, you guys ready? Yeah. <laughs> Can SIR be performed on a double wall tank? No, good. Only what? Yes. You guys are listening, I love you. Okay, what two types of interstitial monitoring can be used on double wall tanks? Dry is one option. Liquid, yes. Dry or hydrostatic monitoring. Okay, if the UST system was installed December 30th, 2003, would the vent line be single wall or double wall? <laughs> single? Double wall. Vent lines are no longer exempt and they're subject to secondary containment requirements. So that was one of the requirements with the 2003 uh, regulatory change was those vent lines were no longer exempt from the, the piping definition, okay? Okay, does this vent line need to be product type? The same scenario, we have December 30th. Yes, I see a head nod, good, yes, it does need to be product type because that was another requirement for post July 1st, uh, 2003 tank installs which also means impervious to liquid and vapors. Okay. <laughs> Don't roll your eyes. We're gonna change things up a little bit. I, I think we're gonna, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, so I think what we're gonna do, we're gonna have, Whoever wants to volunteer for the hot seat, I, we like to do it that way. Just, we don't wanna force anyone uh, you know, out of their comfort zone. But I do still have a class roster, so if no one volunteers, I'm gonna pick somebody. And our prize has been a $5 gift card for Starbucks. <laughs> yeah? And candy? I can. No? Come on, $20. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm gonna have to call someone from San Diego. <laughs> Come on, guys, this is supposed to be interactive, fun, breaking the ice. <laughs> we're all trying to do the same thing here. Otherwise, we're gonna go back to Colleen Rose, or I'm gonna call someone from that list. Is Carla here? <laughs> no, she <laughs> There's Carla. You wanna go again? And you can get $10. No, no, no. <laughs> Carla was our first contestant, and she did quite wonderfully. <laughs> Carla, pick a row between the numbers of four and ten. Seven. Seven, row seven, you are the next contestant. What's row seven? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Come on up, everybody. <laughs> Give them applause. I thought I was, I thought everyone watched $100,000 Pyramid when I was growing up, it was my favorite show. There's gonna be some words up here and you folks are going to be required to give clues to the lucky person that's going to sit right here. Those clues could be remedial, like if it's five, you could say, what's after four? <laughs> <laughs> or you could say something a little bit more in lines with the UST program, you know, like uh, what section is it, yada, yada, yada. So who wants to volunteer to win the prize? <laughs> it's dangerous it was Jeffrey? now that we have all this. Jeffrey. Where are you from, Jeffrey? From Santa Clara County. Santa Clara County, what? excellent. And you do during the day? I do UST, HMBP, <laughs> Hasways. He knows what he's doing. So you just have to give fairly decent clues and you should be able to survive? Okay. So those people further down the line, you'll see the thing. Get your clues ready, okay? <laughs> And uh, we'll, put, we'll put Carmel on the spot, but she's a professional. <laughs> okay, you ready? All right. Six seconds, let's go. So don't stand in front of uh, the screen there, Keith. <laughs> oh, this one right here. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha, thank you. All right. Rust. Rust. 
Corrosion, great. Go Under the fuel pump. <laughs> Under dispenser containment. Yes. Yay. Looks like I picked a winner with Jeffrey. Overfill. Overfill. Audible visual alarm. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, use the clues that we talked about in our, in our presentation. Use... Sink. <laughs> sink. If you don't sink, what are you going to do? Swish. Swim. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that. <laughs> That's cool. Um. See, UDC... Um. Something in the UDC. That alarm, uh, UDC. It's not, um, does not use electricity. Float valve. <laughs> what? <laughs> Good? Float valve. No. Nope. So nope. Next clue. <laughs> oh, wait. We're still in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first word similar to buoyant. Mm. Buoyant. Float valve. I'll take it. I'll take it. Floating chain. All right. Five gallons. First word rhymes with thrill. <laughs> rhymes with thrill. Help. It's a five gallon thrill. Oh, spill containment. <laughs> Great. Some more acronyms. We love the acronyms. Doesn't require a person. <laughs> Doesn't require a person. <laughs> <laughs> monitoring? Continuous monitoring? It's a monitoring option and it's also um, a component, a USC component. Also for all <laughs> Overfill, ATG alarm. Yes. Alarm. Perfect. <laughs> A mechanism uh, other than the ATG used for overfill protection. Another non-electronic? Couldn't really understand. Another mechanism other than ATG and flapper valve used for <laughs> overfill protection. <laughs> <laughs> Ball flow valve. Yeah. <laughs> A date. <laughs> <laughs> that is a match dot com. That is a, a year date that is uh, um, associated with Christmas. Upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> so Christmas. What happened in Christmas? What month is that? Lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 1998, December 22nd. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what? He should get a bonus for that 22nd in there. <laughs> All right. Back to the start. Uh, Carmel, yeah. let's do it. Come on, come on, come on. Uh, it's a, um, another form of overfill. Another form of overfill. Protection. The only other one we have not mentioned. <laughs> Flapper valve. Yeah. Woo -hoo. A term for secondary containment. In between. Between secondary interstitial. No. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much.